I normally do things like this. I hope you can see that now. Um, so it, it's, to me, it's very unusual to be, be here. I, uh, please take photos and then mail them to at like Twitter at Mr. Diamond because I, I'm virtually never in, in rooms like this. I'm normally on big stages. And uh, the, the smallest thing was actually Monday in Berlin where there were also a couple of politicians, but normally I do different stuff. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna leave my computer on. Please look on the screens because everything will be partly happening on the screens. Anyway, if you have a bee, if you're a bee and you put a bee in a bottle like this, and you put the bottle against the window, the bee will fly towards the light and the garden. And because it sees that's where I need to go, it's always been right, this cannot be wrong, this is the freedom, I have to fly there, there I just have to work harder, and the bee will continue doing that in a proper way, like nature told it till it dies. If you put a fly in the same bottle, the fly goes, well, it doesn't work, I try something different and it's out in four minutes. Uh, it's a less in, uh, intelligent animal, but it's definitely more effective. The bee things never change a winning horse. And maybe your company thinks that also. And if you look at this picture of the horse that, that's on your screen right now, you will see that the horse is a very, very strong horse. It had tons of muscle, there's a nice jockey on it. But why does it win? A, it's a strong horse, but also because it runs and performs in a relatively constant environment. It's ground, it hits ground, and the ground is solid. And the ground in one stadium is similar to the ground in the other stadium. Look at your screens. The only thing I change now is the environment. It's now in water. And if, it ch if the environment changes, the exact same horse will not be a winner anymore. And you have new winners, like dolphins, totally slow on land. Not a really, really good racing animal. But in a liquid environment, dolphins totally outperform a horse. We are in a change of environment where all of a sudden startups, totally not good in old business, are really, really good in the new economy. Things what you never really expected to be performing. And if you have new winners, you also have new lo losers. And the old economy is probably all of a sudden a loser. So you have to know your environment. Look at what changes for us and what changed for us, everything. I'm gonna rock you through a bunch of, uh, um, revolutions, first the device revolution. You all know that we currently have 20 billion uh, smartphones on the planet, and by 2014, Ducot said, by 2015, 40% of those will have near field communication. Obviously, with the iPhone 6 just emerging, it will be over 40%. Near field communication will change a lot. I'll dive into that later. We start to wear devices, and everybody wants those. And Apple Watch, again, because Apple is a cool brand, which has a lot of attraction, very excellent marketing, will make it cool, and all the kids like my son now wants an Apple Watch. Can't wait, you know? Uh, serious uh, corporations like Mindshare and stuff like that are dealing with the problem actually launching units just for wearable devices. However, it's not all done outside of Europe. This is a European uh, convention and SAP in Europe. Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry, that comes later. <laughs> so still an American example. What happens if you have a, uh, a device that you can wear, right? Uh, if you have a device that you can wear, I hope you can, s oops, can you see that? Yeah, it's moving. Uh, on your body, it can, like iWatch, it can identify you. And if it identifies you, you can pay, which is obvious. Apple Pay exists and stuff like that, right? You never have to log in into any things, but all of a sudden, all the near field things can be operated because it knows its use. You can open your car. And if you go to a hotel, I bet you are staying in a hotel tonight, normally you have an anonymous card, but now the hotel room knows it's you who is entering. And when the room knows it's you who is entering, he can greet you, select your photos, set the temperature at the right point, and if there's Netflix and you stop watching Netflix, the machine knows where you stop watching a certain Netflix show, and you can continue watching that show. Why? Because it's absolutely individualized. This stuff is happening, and it's happening right now. Uh, Google Glass is also happening. I go to a lot of conventions where you normally you can win. You put your business card in a little fish tank or whatever and they draw it and it used to be th that you could win uh, iPad mini. If you didn't win one, uh, you will never be able to win one again because now you can win Google Glass. You know, Google Glass is the thing everybody wants to win. Google Glass is everywhere. The Austrian army has Google Glass. Uh, people that work in non-customer relations like uh, people that stock 
goods were Google Glass. I was in the UK recently. Bank robbers have Google Glass. A uh, serious problem for the police because, again, we heard this uh, earlier today that regular people can adapt faster because they just buy Google Glass. The police is a lot slower because it has to get regulations and they have to make them safe and stuff like that. And meanwhile, the banks are being robbed. Uh, here, a sign what you can do with Google Glass from a German company, SAP. Uh, everyone's happy is medium true because a lot of people feel way too observed. They find it spooky that the people actually know more than they do. So to me, there's two solutions. A, you make it public. Like instead of using Google Glass, you can just use an iPad and everybody knows it works because it's still, uh, uh, the iBeacon technology would still work. Or you make it even more secret, which is the way it will go because universities are working on lenses uh, where you don't even have to see that the other person knows everything about you. Startups are working on lenses. Google is working on lenses. Uh, still, this is not the end. We have transparent emotions. You might know that Steve Hawken uh, was at a reading com was at a, at a computer that uh, had uh, tracked his vision, and uh, he got so sick that he was down to one letter a minute. Then Justin Ratner from Intel created a machine that predicts his emotion, and he only has to correct when he's wrong. Now he's up to one sentence a minute, from one letter to a sentence. That led Justin Redner to saying, we will be emotionally connected with our devices in a few years. We all know the speed of development. This already happened. Nikomimi was the first device that introduced that. And Nikomimi, you can see it a little bit better with my face, although I don't look as good. Uh, measures your, your brain activity. And uh, let's go back to her. And uh, if you think active thoughts, the ears go up. And if you think passive thoughts, the ears go down. Let's go back to camera. <laughs> Let me push this again. I don't know how this works. Can you see me now? Ears go up, ears go down, right? Very easy. OK. Uh, five months after Nekomim was introduced, the first people connected it to wheelchairs for severely handicapped people. So if you can't go like this anymore, you can still think. If you're in Los Angeles on Venice Boulevard and Venice Beach and stuff, you will see drug addicts and stuff like that using Nekomimi to steer longboards, motorized longboards. And the speed depends on how hard they think, right? I know it's fringes, but it's still happening. Uh, recently, I think four months ago, the medical community noticed that with brain waves, like Nekomimi is a, is a trivial version of a medical device, right? It measures your brain activity. But they, n and they had that for years, but they never understood that in fact they have a yes, no machine. Yes, no, up, down. And all of a sudden they started communicating with people that could never communicate before, coma patients. People that you could poke, no reaction, no eye movement, nothing. I think he's dead, let's pull the plug, okay? Then they go to those coma patients and they say, okay, if you can hear me, think, an active thought for yes, like playing tennis. And if you say no, think a passive thought like relaxing at home. Can you hear me? Yes. What's your father's name? John, Paul, Peter, Mike. No, no, yes, no. You want us to pull the plug? Relax thought. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, next object is Miko. Miko doesn't only measure your brain waves, but also does product selection. Uh, product selection means, uh, in this case, music. So it measures your brain waves and selects music. So if you're relaxed, plays relaxed music. If you're too nervous, also maybe relaxed music and stuff like that. So it's a music selector. I can bet the next uh, thing will be films. Netflix will have that and will select films uh, depending on your mood. The next thing will probably be fashion. If you don't know what to wear, you know, oh, I have nothing to wear. Well, 
your mood food fit, the question mark outfit, uh, and stuff like that. Those things that have to do with taste are definitely going to be emotionally supported by machines. Why is this working? Because all of this is not the end. We live in an age of sensors. Sensors are very, very powerful. Your first phone had five sensors, your first smartphone, right? Three screen sensors, two motion sensors. Then even while Steve Jobs was alive, gyroscope, accelerometer, compass, proximity sensor, ambient light, everything was introduced, your new phone has 15 sensors. If you add that with a uh, Apple Watch type thing or a fitness band, you have an additional 10 sensors. So you are wearing 25 sensors on your body. But still those, if you have a car, a good car has over 100 sensors. We are surrounded by sensors. This room is full of sensors. We know the humidity, how many people are in the room, if it's burning or not, it's transparency good. All those sensors exist. Still, all those things currently are communication silo. This basically means that the Apple Watch will communicate with your iPhone, for instance. In certain places, I was in Australia two weeks ago, uh, those si silos can be opened a little bit. Like, for instance, the Nike fuel band data is open, so you can go to McDonald's and ask McDonald's what you can eat. And then McDonald's, McDonald's looks at your Nike fuel band data and says you did a lot of sports, have a Big Mac and a double fries, or you did nothing, just have a salad, uh, which can be relatively good. Uh, I have vitamin D deficiency, I just found out. And so I would find it really, really good if my muesli, I don't know if you have that in your country where they individualize your muesli, uh, if my muesli were to know that and add goji berries or something automatically. So I would be happy to open my health data to my muesli so that I can eat healthier food. And in, in winter, they add vitamin C, natural, or organic, obviously, and in, in whatever stuff like that, you get the point, right? Uh, communication silos are defined by you actively allowing uh, access to your information. That used to be when your computer was introduced. When your computer was introduced, it was a communication silo because it communicated with your printer and maybe with four other computers in the office. That was it. And then the silo died and the browser was introduced. And the browser made the World Wide Web. That's the globe and eyes of the World Wide Web. Because now you can access every computer. You can access every server, right? MIT is working on a browser for sensors. That basically means I can access everything. I can access this room, I can access all the cars, I can access your health. Uh, currently, we can access maps and then we can flip to the non-real-time sensor in the sky, which is satellite view, and if your city is big enough, we can, send, we can change to a non-real-time sensor on ground, which is street view. Uh, but soon I will be able, or actually now if this will connect it, I will be able to see the number of people, the noise level, the temperature, and the humidity uh, of the rooms, and I will even know with iBeacon if I'm in the room or not. If they know that I'm in the room, I can have individualized messages like, hey, Dietmar, the steaks you wanted last time are here now, you know? And I say, yay, great, you know? So sensors know a lot of stuff, and sensors individualize. Sensors detect context. Flip to a car, you, if you have a luxury car like a Mercedes, you might know that the rear view mirror detects if you're tired or not, okay? And if you're tired or not, it still is a communication silo. The wheel shakes. That's all it does. You're tired, the wheel shakes, right? But now, what if that goes public, okay? Then advertising is re... The, the definition of advertising is challenged, and the new definition of advertising could be tweaking what information people are exposed to conveniently. So I detect this is a tired person. Where is the information that I can expose? What information could I expose? Coffee, for instance, where would be convenient navigation system, right? So if you look at your navigation system and I expose Starbucks, where would you go? Most likely the Starbucks, right? If I expose McCafe, so Starbucks, <laughs> then you probably go to McCafe, right? Uh, now imagine this is, we're not talking about coffee, now imagine we're talking about 100 liters of gasoline. The empty thing is all of a sudden open. I say, hey, I have a guy here who's going to spend probably whatever, many euros or whatever currency that is, on gasoline. Who wants to be on the navigation system? I see 75 cents, 85, 95, one dollar four, one dollar eight, and it goes to British Petrol. So that's real-time bartering. Is that all a dream? No, it's happening. SAP did it again. Germany, power, and BMW. <laughs> based on their location, weight, and preferences. Imagine your car advising you where to fill up and inviting you for a free cup of coffee. 
Okay, due to time, we rock through this. Uh, look at it, you know, it's all happening, and it's the media revolution. The media revolution is now going into engaging media, but in the first uh, uh, years, it was about PCs and uh, mobiles and stuff like that, and obviously, um, digital surpassed TV usage, and soon mobile is gonna use the, uh, is, is gonna surpass TV usage, right? The user experience today starts mobile, and the thing is that if, I don't know if you have car to go or those sharing things in, in, your, in your country, where do those cars exist? On your phone, you look at them, you see them on your phone, you push the button on the phone. Of course, currently you have to go to the car, but soon it will come anyway, but anyway, it exists on your phone, the job is done on your phone. If you have a luxury car, you expect that you can see if the windows are closed, how much gasoline is on your phone. The user experience is on your phone, and the phone is also the only thing that's with you through the entire customer journey. You might look at it even in the store, you are still able to change your opinion uh, and buy certain things. I think I have some slides uh, to that, and we still have a little bit of time. Uh, the huge difference between the mobile revolution and the PC revolution is that the mobile revolution was user-driven. The PC revolution, everybody hated. If you're the, what I call before generation, I don't talk about digital natives anymore, I call it the, uh, now the normals, and the others are the before generation. But if you're part of the before generation, you might remember that your secretary hated the computer. She wanted to, or she or he wanted to work on the typewriter. And they had to be forced to use the computer. Mobile, everybody wanted. I got my first mobile phone that big. I want one, look, I can carry my phone. <laughs> it was really good. Facebook was not on mobile. The users demanded mobile. They said, you need a mobile app. And currently, 62% of the uh, ad revenue from Facebook is created mobile. So that's a huge, huge change. Still, a lot of stuff is happening online. If you have kids, uh, I see the audience a little bit older, you might know that they only watch people play uh, Minecraft. They don't even play it themselves anymore, they watch people play video games. This is called Creator Networks. Uh, for those people, just uh, to give a little bit of an explanation, social networks like Facebook are based on who you know, your friends, right? Creator uh, networks are based on what you love, like playing Minecraft or watching video games or cooking at home or doing things at home, okay? Those creator networks are run by guys like him. PewDiePie, you probably know him, and he's an amateur. Everybody was f who was forced to take Latin in school remembers that amateur comes from Amara, I do it out of love. He's not a professional, he loves to play video games, he's a Swedish guy, started to play video games, and how many subscribers does he have now? You might know that, over 30 million. He's bigger than your national TV station. Maker Studio, who does those things, was bought by Disney for $2 billion last month or two months ago. This is a serious, serious development. People are not, kids are not watching cartoons anymore, they're watching other people play video games or something like that. Creator networks, very, very big. We have amateur consultants, uh, people that do eyelashes and stuff like that and say, I make eyeshadow is much better than L'Oreal. And they have, this is a German one, over five million views. Huge, huge impact. We have amateur journalists like uh, Vice. It is not, again, a print journalist in a tie and a suit standing in front of a camera. It's a guy with a hood on his face robbing a bank. It says, we are robbing a bank right now. Oh my God, it's really exciting, you know? This is amateur journalists that go where the action is. How much is that worth? $2.5 billion currently. So we're talking about a huge, huge change in media. Amateurs are starting to rule. Democratization is coming because digital is democratization. Everybody has access to media, to information, to all kinds of things. Uh, Seven more minutes, maybe, yeah. if that's okay. Media revolution, open marketing was about seducing the customer. You wanted to sell the, the, the drink and you showed some legs. New marketing is about understanding the customer. Understanding needs, deviating from the needs, big data, and then being creative with the data. Everybody has big data. If you're in the, uh, let me switch to my camera. Look, I don't know how to do that. Whatever, look at me. If you're doing, the, I am now. If you're in the Gauss curve in the center, that's totally, totally boring. Everybody is there. It's like a, being married to a person who says, well, here's your toast again. And you said, you give me toast for 35 years, but you love it so much. 
No, I hate it now, you know. You cannot predict something just due to the past, right? You have to take the data and be creative with it. Uh, big data is, uh, is energy for creators, right? So be creative and step out of those things. Uh, if somebody buys that, maybe they want to buy something different. Old time advertising was about masses, you know, I call it high reach, low relevance. Millions of people see the ad potentially, but none of them even looks at that wrong target group. None of them will buy that car, right? Today it's about low reach and high relevance. This is the only person in the world who gets the information that the McDonald's is 80 meters that way, 30 meters this way. If, if he uses a McFinder, very, very likely that he will go to a McDonald's. You know, it's about one person, target group of one. B there and the person is looking for you. You it, in the old times you had to try to contact the person. In the new times the person contacts you. Be there. Don't don't say all of our customers are very important to us. We will be with you shortly. Boo you you know boom gone you know make more your stuff more individual be less like a book. A book is it was a stormy day when the captain took to sea be more like a letter. Hey John how is it going? How are the kids? Is the captain still dead? <laughs> Individualized, last seven mi or four minutes. Individualized marketing and individualization, I mean really, really radical. That's why I call it the narcissism of marketing. You know, the website has to know what I like. The website has to s uh, know my size and show me the things that I click or what social media is portraying. Uh, if you go online with iBeacon, I have a bunch of iBeacon things, especially Macy's is good in the US, but also others are relatively good. Uh, they know what you looked at online, and then you get the information when you're in the store. The beauty of iBeacon is that you don't get the information at home, so there's no spam, but when you're in the store, you get the information you're likely to buy that, right? I was actually uh, using iBeacon in, in LA in a different store, however, and when I went to the exit, I got this information. You've been with us for almost one hour. Would you like a free coffee? Coffee seems to be the, the currency, right? Uh, why did they know that? Because I'd be contracted that I went to the exit. Would I have gotten the message if I were uh, in a changing room or at a cash register? Probably not. So the reality is like, hey, we're noticing you're leaving the house. Can we buy you back for a cup of coffee? They could. And actually, if you do that kind of stuff, says the German fashion and retail industry, you will generate 400% more profit. If you have one face to the customer, one channel, everything is totally seamless, 400% more profit. I asked them, what is 400%? Is it 116 instead of 104? They said, no, it's 400 instead of 100. It's really, 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 really big. Individualize your products, narcissism of products. We only like the products because they have our name on it. I have my own stamp in Austria. <laughs> I really like it. Uh, <laughs> If you're from England, you know that you can go to Harvey Nichols and you get yourself 3D printed in chocolate for 160 pounds. Uh, you, that piece of chocolate probably weighs, what, 250 grams? 250 grams, even the most expensive Belgium chocolate is not 160 pounds or 250 grams. So that's the price of individualization. If you individualize stuff, if you have headphones that are molded, 3D printed to your inner ear, that's really, really valuable. Individualized user experiences, uh, we all know that Stuff to us is too complicated or too easy. Games are always right. If you play video games, they're always right. They're always in the flow zone. This is now happening with all kinds of devices like TVs. Even if you buy a new TV, they know well in the beginning, I teach you to switch it on and off. Louder, softer. And then later, I teach you to program. They don't basically clubber you down, right? So you can do that with websites, with mobile experiences, with goods. Just take the, so the hardware, uh, the software that was developed for games, put it on your service. Individualized services, I'm in Dubai a lot. And in Dubai, people have 40 cars and nobody insures 40 cars. They only insure the car they drive. Obviously, I give them my data. I, I put a geolocation tr tracking device on it so that it knows the car's in the house or the car's on the street, but I can save tons of money. And if, if I can actually barter service for data, I'm willing to give my data. If I don't get anything back, if the trade is not fair, I don't. But if it's a fair trade, like better food, um, li less expensive uh, car insurance, or not arguing with my wife if I should go left or right, you know, I'm relatively willing to give my data. Last point, individualization of reality, the narcissism of reality. We all know that social media in reality is completely narcissistic. It's the most narcissistic media there is. In real life, you talk about yourself 30% of the time. In social media, you talk about yourself 80% of the time. If you now go a little bit further and you take Oculus Rift, which was bought by Facebook for $2 billion, you can start completely individualizing your reality. If you combine that with uh, five 
G, uh, G5 networks where you have 800 megabytes per second download. You can have cameras that film the reality and project it on, on Oculus Rift. You can walk through New York and then you can get, of rid, can get of rid of everybody in the street. Just a computer model replacing with pigs. Face to face becomes interface to interface. In my point of view, B2B is dead. B2C is dead. The only thing that lives currently is H to H, human to human. It's an absolutely individualized world. Content is king, but context is King Kong. And, <laughs> and just if you're going, yeah, it's true for everybody, n but not me, A, Reed Kahneman, you know, we tend to exempt ourselves from examples. You know, it's normal that you say in my country it's different. And please, please, please remember this last saying, which everybody knows. It is not the strongest species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. Thank you very much. <laughs>